Well, hello. It's good to be with you for another recorded message. Uh, this one is for January the 17th, 2021, and I uh, hope that you had a good week. I know that uh, from uh, all of the COVID statistics, uh, we seem to be having more positive tests and more um, cases in general, more hospitalizations. So we continue to meet remotely and we'll continue to do that for a while and we'll get back with you whenever we have uh, made a decision to go back to uh, in-person worship. Until then, um, stay healthy and uh, continue to pray for one another, uh, send cards and call each other, uh, stay in contact with one another and uh, um, let's just continue to pray for God to be with all of our uh, frontline workers in the medical fields. I'm sure that this is a uh, very stressful time for them, um, and I ask that you would remember them in your prayers. Um, today I want to share a message with you. It's the first of four. I want to do a little series. I have done it before, but I want to do a little series of, of messages for you. If the Lord continues to lead me in that direction, and if he does, I will finish that uh, first Sunday in February, and then I'll follow that up with a, <clears throat> um, I'll figure out how to do it uh, if we're still not meeting in person, but uh, do a spiritual gift test and uh, give you the chance to find out, uh, confirm what your spiritual gift test, what your spiritual gifts are, and how to be using those uh, to help build the kingdom. Um, and really the reason I'm picking this time of the year for this is that it, it is a good way to start the year um, to understand how we're supposed to be working for the kingdom of God. Um, and I'm not sure there's, uh, in my recent memory, there has been a more uh, challenging time to know uh, what we're supposed to be doing and how we can minister uh, appropriately uh, during this time of uh, isolation and quarantine and uh, safe distance and those type things. So I hope this message uh, today and the next three that follow will help you. And then um, again, if you have not learned what your spiritual gifts are, we'll have a time for that in uh, early to mid February. And uh, I'm hoping that you will enjoy this and uh, really get plugged into what your ministry can be. You know, um, if somebody were to come to you today and ask you, um, what you felt was the most important church statistic, um, kind of demonstrating the vitality of the local congregation to, to uh, um, show what the vitality of the church itself would be. Um, you know, what would you say to them? In the past, it might be our membership. I know that's one of the things that I hear brought up when uh, I'm with other people uh, at my workplace or out in the uh, community and I hear people talking about their church um, a lot of times we'll hear they have a certain amount of members and um, I don't believe that membership is the best way for us to uh, really gauge the greatness of a congregation but that is the one I hear a lot of uh, in fact I, I know a lot of churches that have hundreds of members and uh, their attendance isn't that, but they have hundreds and hundreds of members. And um, some of those that are hundreds and hundreds of their membership may even be physically dead and just not removed from their membership. So I'm not sure that that is the best way to tell. And in 2020, um, we discovered that attendance is not the best way to tell either because a lot of churches have not been meeting for a lot of 2020. Um, so it's difficult to uh, put your finger on what is the greatness of a church when you look at it in that direction. So um, the greatness of a church is how many people find out what their spiritual gifts are uh, and use them uh, for the glory of God. I believe that is the key. I believe it's always been the key. I've always spoke about this. Uh, it's not because I consider our church to be small because I think we're average size. Um, I just believe that no matter what your numerical statistics and data says that uh, if you haven't found your gift from God and if you're not using it um, your church is not as great as it could be um, so I want to talk about this for the next few weeks um, I've talked about it in 2017 so it's been four years a lot of this is going to be familiar to those that have uh, been listening to me preach for 
uh, a lot of years because I try to cycle through this about every uh, four to five years. So some of you have heard it a bunch of times. Probably some of you could preach it right along with me. Um, so it's not going to be new to you. But I do ask and I do pray before each time that I uh, bring a message before you, whether it's recorded or live, that the Holy Spirit brings something fresh in you, um, even if it's uh, tried and true material that you've heard before. Um, I believe that it's not just knowing um, that God has gifted me to do the ministry. I believe it's important for me to know how he has gifted me and then how I can use that gift um, so that we can be a great church, so that we can understand God's gift and what he wants for us. Um, second, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapters 2 and 3 is where Paul talks about three classes of people, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and, and chapter 3, we're going to read parts of that, so your homework would be to read all of that. Um, and I'm going to read the scripture in a minute, but in uh, chapter 3, verse 3, I just want to focus on one verse to begin with, and it kind of should be our focus uh, throughout this whole process. Paul asks a question, he says, are you not walking like mere men? Uh, in other words, Paul is amazed uh, because when he looks at the church, he doesn't see a difference. Um, he doesn't see a spiritual power. He doesn't see a spiritual anointing. Um, he says that when he looks at people, are we just looking at mere people? Um, in other words, what's the difference? What's the difference between uh, people listening to this message uh, and the people that don't even go to church? What is the difference? Uh, are we just walking around like mere men and women? Um, some of the uh, statistics on mainline churches uh, from about uh, 15 years ago, I share these because they show kind of the average condition in Amer of the church in America. 50% uh, are not certain of their salvation. 60% seldom attend church. 80% have no ministry within the congregation. 80%. 80% uh, do not attend Sunday school or any small groups. 71% say they have heard of spiritual gifts. 31% can name a spiritual gift they believe that they possess. So 71% have heard of spiritual gifts. 31% uh, think they can name one that they might possess and 12% claim that they do not have a spiritual gift so that's what the average church in America looks like statistically from in that in that vein of spiritual gifts and local ministry so you say what's the problem well um, it's just what Paul is saying things haven't changed that much in 2,000 years um, we're still walking around like mere men um, I believe that Christians are living beneath the privilege that we have been given. Um, John chapter 10, um, he says, I have come that you might have life. And then there's a comma. And he says, I have come that you might have life, comma, and have it more abundantly. Um, so I got a question for you this morning. Which side of the comma are you living on? Um, are we living or are we really living? Are we walking around like mere men and women or as people that have been empowered and equipped to do the work of Christ? Um, that's the question for us today. Um, now we'll turn to the scripture I talked about in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. Um, there's three kinds of people that I want us to see here. And the first one is called the natural man. Verse 14, um, chapter 2, verse 14. But a natural man does not accept the things of Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. So it says that a, a natural man has no appreciation for spiritual things. Now, you, you probably know a lot of people that this would fit the category for. They have no appreciation for spiritual things. Uh, they have, uh, maybe in your past you've experienced, they have no respect for what you do uh, as a spiritual person. They don't understand why you come to church. They don't understand why you come early on a Sunday to a breakfast and, and have a business meeting with the men or, or come on a, a Thursday in the middle of the afternoon for a women's group meeting or come on Tuesday night to a choir practice or come on Wednesday night to a prayer service. They, they don't understand why we do those things. Um, so they have no appreciation for them. Uh, now the spirit is the part that had communion has communion with God and the soul is the where we get our reason from our base for decision making 
And the body, of course, is what we see. Uh, in the beginning, Adam and Eve sinned, and when they sinned, um, the spirit part, the communion part with God is what fell down and crashed to the very basement of our lives. Adam and Eve, instead of being spiritual men and spiritual women, uh, become natural. And uh, the natural man has no appreciation for spiritual things. Um, why? Because in the beginning, when man sinned, the spirit, that part that has communion with God, is what fell. That's what fell apart. Uh, it's what fell down. Um, not only do they have no appreciation for spiritual things, they have no comprehension of spiritual things. <clears throat> uh, they don't understand it. They don't appreciate it. They have no comprehension. Um, many, many years ago, um, one of my first jobs, I worked up here on High Point Road in Greensboro at a place called Davidson's Electronics. And we sold uh, a lot of different things, TVs and a lot of electronics. But one of the things uh, the guy that worked there did the most is CBs, uh, the Citizens Band Radios. Uh, a lot of truckers would use them. And the common expression then would be, you call somebody's handle, you didn't go by your name, you had a special name, a handle, and you would ask someone, hey, do you have your ears on? In other words, do you have your radio on or you're on this channel? We, we sold 23 channel CBs and radios and we sold 40 channel CB radios. And so if you were gonna be on there, your friends would know what channel you was gonna be on and they would just ask across the CB radio, hey, do you have your ears on? And uh, if you didn't have your CB, if you didn't have your CB on, if you didn't have your CB on the right channel, you would never know that person was asking, uh, do you have your ears on? So guess what? You didn't. You didn't have your ears on. Um, it's the exact same thing that happened here. We don't have our spiritual ears on because they died in the garden. Um, remember when God looked at Adam and Eve and he said, if you eat of the, take of that fruit, you will surely die. Well, uh, <clears throat> he didn't mean physically. He didn't mean physically right now you're going to die. Um, in fact, Adam lived to be over 900 years of age. Um, he lived to be a very old person. So he didn't mean physically you're going to die right now if you eat it. He meant you're going to die spiritually. Um, that's what Paul says in Ephesians 2.1 as well. Uh, that he says that tells us that we are dead in our trespasses and in our sins. We're dead. We can't comprehend. We can't appreciate the spiritual things. We have no ability to, to uh, uh, receive a spiritual reality in our lives without God. We have no chance of doing it without God. Uh, so that's what the Christian can look at the world and see that there's kind of crazy. We see the values, we see the things being done, and we ask ourselves, man, this is one messed up world that we live in. I'm not sure how much longer we're going to be here. Uh, we see things differently than those that are not Christian. So we talk about the natural man, and then Paul talks about the spiritual man. Uh, he talks about a couple of characteristics of what the spiritual man is, verses 15 and 16. He who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So the spiritual man has the, a characteristic that he is uh, capable of discernment. Um, they understand and they discern what God is doing. They can appraise things. Um, it means we have the ability to evaluate the things of God, to appraise them. Uh, did you notice that Paul did not say that uh, the spiritual person knows all things? Uh, he didn't say that they're smarter in all things. Uh, Paul said that the spiritual man has the ability to evaluate, uh, to appraise, to discern certain things. So where do they get this power to do this from? Where, where do they get this discernment? Where does it come from? Um, well, it comes from God himself, and it comes in four different areas. Um, and I want to read to you from uh, James, New Testament book of James, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. James, the servant of God and the Lord of Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Boy, that sounds like us today, doesn't it? Uh, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking of anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, 
who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. James 1, 1 through 5. Um, so what does that say there? It says that, that uh, we go to our knees. Uh, we pray. We talk to God. We ask for wisdom. And if we ask for wisdom and we really want it, he will give it to us. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 98. Thy commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are every mine. I have more insight than all my teachers for thy, my testimonies and my meditation. I understand more than the aids because I have observed thy precepts. We go to the word. We go to the word of God. So we go to our knees in prayer. We go to the word uh, to get more information. Proverbs 1.5 says, A wise man will have an increase of learning, and a man of understanding will require wise counsel. So we go to the wise. We go to the wise. Our knees, we go to the word, we go to the wise, and finally we go to the Holy Spirit. Uh, John 14, 26. 14, 26. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Go to the Holy Spirit. Isn't it great that we can go to the Holy Spirit and have someone that can help us? Um, I can tell you from personal experience, many times I have gone uh, into a, a hospital room uh, or in uh, to visit with someone and wait with a family that's had surgery, and scripture will come to me that I did not think that I knew beforehand. The Holy Spirit comes to us in our moment of need. People look at the spiritual person, and what grabs me is they're, they're amazed at how they think and how they live. Um, the natural man is amazed at the spiritual man. And if we do it right, they, they want to see and they want to have what we have. So questions that we may want to ask ourselves, um, do others express a desire for God when they are around me? Do others see a difference in the way that I live? Do they sense a spiritual power uh, that is greater than anything they've seen? Do they, do they walk a higher road when they're around me? Um, I'm basically asking, uh, as Paul was asking the church at Corinth, is there something different? Is there something about my life um, that is appetizing, that the natural man would want to gravitate towards? Am I living or am I really living? Do we make people hungry for, to know more about God? Um, do they ever even know that we know him from our interactions with them? Uh, are we like walking like we are on a higher spiritual plane. I'm not talking about being mystic. I'm not talking about muttering and uh, half under your breath uh, saying scripture all the time. I'm talking about living in a real world in a real way with real joy, with a real testimony. That's what I'm talking about. Now, for some of you, that may be muttering. <laughs> but for most of us, it's not. I think there ought to be a difference between the way the Christian views the world and the future than the way that the non-Christian does. I think there ought to be a huge difference in the way that we view it. Paul says that the spiritual man and the natural man are not the same, and I don't, they don't think the same, they don't live the same, uh, they don't have the same future. Um, he says that we're to be a light into the world. Well, there's a lot of darkness in our world right now. We gotta find a way to shine the light. Uh, he says we're to be the salt to the world. I'm telling you right now, uh, if we're spirit-filled, um, field, we ought to be, be making people salty. They ought to see a difference. They ought to see God living in our lives. And then finally, the third type of person that we see here is the carnal man, and that's in chapter uh, 3, verses 1 through 3. And I, brethren, take, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of the flesh, as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not able to receive it. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, you are fleshy. And you are not walking, are you not walking like mere men? Talks about a carnal man, the carnality, uh, allowing the uh, attitudes of the world and the appetites of the flesh uh, to be, to control the human nature, uh, to decide what we're going to do. Um, if you want to know what a carnal Christian looks like, Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 7. Um, he talks about it because he was one. Um, we've all been one 
at one time or another. Uh, Paul talks about the two natures that are at work with him. You remember the scripture well. It says the things I want to do, I find that I can't do. I don't do. Excuse me, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. You know what Paul says. He says, I love God and I want to go to heaven. Um, but every time temptation comes, I don't have enough power to say no to it. Paul's saying this. I want to do a certain thing, but I don't do it. Every time something comes to me that I know is wrong and I don't even want to do it, I find myself doing it. He says, there are some things I should do. I should pray. I should read the word of God. Uh, but I find myself not doing those things that I know that I should be doing. In other words, he's saying there's a war waging inside of me. Um, and he's conflict. He's in constant conflict. Um, at the end of the Romans, he says, I am a wretched man. Who can deliver me from this terrible situation I'm in? That's the plea that we all make eventually. I'm a wretched person. Who can deliver me from this terrible situation that I am? Who can deliver me and give me a future and a hope? That's what the carnal Christian uh, takes one step forward and two steps back. Uh, instead of becoming uh, victors over sin, they become victims of sin. And a major, major difference uh, of a carnal Christian is immaturity. Paul tells them here in the scripture that they are babes in Christ. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a baby. Uh, everyone's been born a baby. But there's something wrong if you stay a baby all your life. Um, there's a lot of joy in a maternity ward. A lot of joy whenever you see the, hear that a baby's going to be born. Uh, you see the gender reveals. Uh, you see uh, people getting ready and packing their bags for that special day when they're going to go and have that baby. There are a lot of hopes and dreams in that maternity ward. Uh, but I'm telling you right now, there would not be as near as much excitement in that maternity ward uh, if the mother realized that they'd be changing diapers on that baby and that baby wouldn't grow up for the next 20 years. Um, it's all right to change diapers for a few months. Um, it's all right to get up in the middle of the night and help them out uh, for a while. Um, but eventually there is some growth that is expected. There's a maturity that is expected. Um, Paul says there's two things that a carnal Christian never does. Uh, he tells them in verse 2 that they're still on baby food. And they're still on milk because they can't eat solid food. Well, another thing that I see about the carnal Christian is that they, uh, they're, they're selfish. They never give in. Um, he says in verse 3, you're jealous, you're full of strife, you're petty, you're picky. Um, when something doesn't go our way with a carnal Christian, we just take our ball and go home. Y'all aren't going to play the way that I want to play, that I'm just going to take my ball and go home. Um, you know, the, a lot of times they're the person that says that the sermon is too long, the sermon is too short, the lights are too bright, the lights are too dim, it's too hot, it's too cold. Um, the other thing that we see is that they never grow up. They're static. So you selfish and static. Paul says, you know what? You've been on baby food for uh, too long, and uh, you shouldn't be on baby food anymore, but I can't teach you anything new because you're still drinking that spiritual milk. Hebrews 5:12. You have been a Christian for a long time now, and you ought to be teaching others, but instead you have dropped back to the place where you need someone else to teach you all over again the very first principles of God's Word. You're like babies who can drink only milk and not old enough for solid food. And when a person is still living on milk, it shows that he isn't very far along in the Christian life and doesn't know much difference between right and wrong. He's still a baby Christian. You'll never be able to eat solid spiritual food and understand the deeper things of the Word of God until you become a better Christian and learn the right from wrong by practicing by doing right. So nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to be static. Nobody wants to be that selfish. So uh, let me give you four steps to becoming a spirit-filled Christian. Uh, I'm going to tell you how to get out of the nursery, how to get out of the maternity ward, and move your way towards maturity. Um, first thing is we've got to realize your need. You have to realize your need. It's hard to make any change in life until you realize that you need to make a change. So you've got to realize your need. Um, and when you do that, you've got to repent of your ways. The way you've been doing is not working. I repent of my ways, and I want to make a change. And if you're going to make a change, you have to release your rights. You have to tell God, I'm going to do things your ways. Uh, what I've been doing isn't working. I realize I have a need. I repent of my ways, and I'm going to uh, release my 
uh, rights to you. I'm going to do things uh, for you. And if you do that, you receive God's power. Acts 1-8 tells us that we receive God's power. I would hope that every one of us today can concentrate ourselves and let the Holy Spirit move in, uh, not as resident, but as president of our life, uh, as a leader, as the owner, as the boss. You never know how God wants to use you uh, to make a difference in the world. And I'm going to close with a story about that. It was from the News and Record several years ago, probably about 20 years ago now. Uh, what's the, it was a, a, a title was written in to send a letter for, and it was, what's the most unselfish gesture or conversely ungrateful moment you've witnessed recently? And this is the uh, story. I recently was laid off from a job of almost seven years. I went by my pastor's home for the evening. The layoff occurred and conveyed the news and asked for prayer. Even though I am a woman of faith, I still needed assurance that, and reassurance that God was in control. Being a single mom, finances uh, have always been slim and I was concerned about meeting monthly bills until I could find gainful employment again. My six-year-old pastor's daughter overheard a portion of our conversation that afternoon, but little did I know how it impacted her. When I arrived at church that night for midweek service, she came to me with a Ziploc bag. In the bag was some change and a few dollar bills along with some chewing gum and a Tic Tac, breath mint. She told me that she had taken the money from her piggy bank, piggy bank with her mom and dad's permission because she wanted me to have money to help pay the bills. She wanted me to have the other two things just to make me feel better. I saw the face of God that evening in the upturned smiling face of a wonderful little girl. I will always, always cherish her act of kindness. I still have that bag of money, and I keep it in my dresser as a reminder of God's love for me, as well as that of a little six-year-old girl named Anna. Folks, that's, uh, that's how God wants to work through us. Uh, sometimes it's in uh, a little bitty way, um, a few dollars in a Ziploc bag, uh, and a, just a little care package for one another. Um, let's pray that we can be used the way that God wants us to use and let's get serious about this business of being the church of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your uh, blessings to us this past week. Uh, Lord, I, I thank you for being with those that are uh, dealing with all kinds of sickness at this particular time. And I ask that you would continue to uh, give us guidance on how to reach others for Christ, how to make a difference, how to continue to be the church and to be one that is thriving in, uh, in this uh, difficult time that we're in with the uh, virus. I ask that you would be with uh, each of our people and those that are listening for the first time. Encourage them in their walk with you. And I give you all the praise and glory. In your name we pray. Amen.